Okay. Denver Holmes. I'm Liberty. And we're uh, here to give you an update on some of the fall research and happenings that have been going on over the last month or so or more. And we're in our our field station lab. So it's kind of a cool background and Lib has a bunch of things to say. Yeah. So I thought we could just start by kind of doing hitting on a couple of the different nets. So that we have hands on at least. Okay. So let's start with our failed long-eared owl nest. Okay, so what do we know about the long-eared nest? Uh, you know, we just weren't sure, and we went down afterwards. Uh, we had all the problems with it, and she abandoned the magpie with the scene in there. At first, we thought perhaps somebody got in there because it's not too far from the road, but that wasn't the case. However, it did seem to coincide with, uh, we had some pretty violent storms, uh, that night and the day before, real high winds and heavy, heavy rain. And we were just wondering if, if that didn't affect the nest. It was not in a real good position. Usually they're in a more protected cover and a little, a little tighter, more structured nest. And that one there was out on the branches. It was in kind of a little alleyway where it picked up a lot of wind and bad weather. So what we, what we believe happened, we can't say it conclusively, but we believe that Something happened during the storm, and then that's why the nest failed. Okay. Um, so Matt did find one egg remaining in the nest. Yeah, he did, egg. and then there was both. The magpies, as you saw in the okay. video, had gotten in there afterwards. Uh, we never did find the remains of a chick. We're not sure what happened. And maybe there's some evidence on the videos, but we weren't able to detect it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see, do we want to say anything about the other camps? They seem to be going well. I mean, Charlie's gotten whacked again, <laughs> but he he weathers them and is always back up on the perch pretty quickly. Well, uh, you know, it sounds like the Osprey doing well. Charlie must be pretty tough. Uh, he's gotten whacked by the great horns. And once again, it's the year of the great horned owls. They're just, you know, they're just showing us what they're made of. It's kind of a... <laughs> An aggressive owl and uh, tough as can be and intolerant it seems of about anything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so interesting behaviors are seen from the great horns. But you know, Charlie, hang in there. If you don't get a broken back out of this, then um, you're going to make it. <laughs> okay. So then, um, I guess we just go to the great gray, which is what most of my questions uh, are about. The great grays. Do we have a camera on them? <laughs> <laughs> Trying. Um, okay, so, you know, with our second great gray cam at Jim's place, it has been up just about two weeks, just over two weeks, which is amazing. It feels a lot longer than that. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So in that time, you know, I mean, we were introduced to this nest. She was on eggs, immediately a chick hatched. I mean, we didn't know these owls, but we learned so much in the two weeks about them, about the area, about threats about you know things going on just with the ecology and um so i guess i just want to back up then and say what did we know about this pair before the cam went live yeah before the cam went live um a friend of mine a wildlife researcher here uh, works for the tribe and uh, he had told me that he had seen during the course of the winter every now and then he would see a great gray hanging along the fence line on this road uh just you know hunting I'm in the ditch along the road there. And so I would go up there and look for it. Of course, I'd never see it. And, um, you know, we just looked and looked and spent the winter looking. And then one day I was up there and uh, caught a glimpse of a great gray owl and actually caught a glimpse of two great gray owls. And that kind of began my, you know, uh, regular visit to the area and to watch them. We, you know, we have a little theory, at least around here, where we believe that. Uh, pairs or males and female great gray owls will winter together where they don't have to have you know high elevation migrations and so that's what we thought was going on we thought man given the size maybe this is a pair so we started just to go up there periodically and try to get glimpses of them and then uh, because of where it was I, um, I took some information I stuck in the mailbox at this house that I was hoping was associated with the land that we were seeing the owls with and um, Left some information and then the, the people eventually contacted Liberty and contacted me and by the time we got everything rolling and went and chatted with them and stuff, what they told us that about three years ago, uh, two great gray owls showed up 
at their place and were hunting the fields there. And that's all they knew. They would see them from time to time, sometimes one bird, sometimes two birds. But uh, they didn't have much information other than the great gray owls showed up about three years ago and they would see them from time to time. And they were very nice and very approachable. And, uh, and that was it. So they didn't know if they were nesting, they didn't know if they were made a pair, they didn't know anything about them. And that's where we've stepped in and, and, and now started to provide that information. But we don't have any concrete evidence to say, yes, this is the same pair that's been nesting in this area year after year. No, no, we don't know if they even nested in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Were they a young pair hanging out that didn't nest? Were they an experienced pair? Did they nest? Uh, there's no indication of that. Um, yeah, no indication whatsoever. What we did is we just kind of pieced together just basic knowledge of all natural history to, to tell ourselves, we, we should watch for nests. I bet something's happening. And so we would kind of monitor the pair. And then very often, as with so many species that we study, you have a group and or a pair. Then all of a sudden you have one. And when we see that, if nothing has happened to the other one, we think, okay, we've got one now, so maybe number two is on the nest, and that's the female. And so we kind of played that game with the great gray owls here, and then um, then Leonard and a couple of the other you know people on our team went in one day, and they saw a great gray sitting there, broken off uh, snag, which was you know we thought was great. A week later, we went in and we spotted a great gray on that snag, sitting in the nest, and that's how we kind of can, well, that's how we tracked them to nesting. Mm -hmm. First great grave I've ever seen was her. First great grave I've ever seen, you, mm -hmm. you find a nest. Maybe that's, that's why I'm so attached to her. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, you know, obviously, like I said, a lot happened since the cam went live, including the chick being taken by the great horned owl, and, um, and questions about why that even happened. Why was she off the nest so long that night? So, I guess we kind of have two two things that it could be. Either the male isn't bringing the resources that he needs to keep her on her nest so she doesn't have to leave it, or he's just not able to find the resources. And, and maybe they're not even, you know, you can't separate the two, I'm not sure. But. Yeah, it's tough, you know, um, as with most species of owls, the females, they are usually pretty tight to the nest. Um, particularly throughout the daytime periods. And then they'll go off at night to go to the bathroom, stretch, cast a pellet, maybe receive prey. Uh, right from the beginning, she seemed to be off the nest more than mm -hmm. I would have liked anyway. You know, I don't know what she's exactly thinking. But she, uh, yeah, she seemed to be off the nest quite a bit. And there's, in my opinion, um, and we're still learning a lot about Great Grace here, but there just didn't seem to be a lot of food deliveries to her or food that was incubating. And, um, and I thought that there would be, and then the fact she was off the nest. And then everything else that was going on in the valley this year uh, has kind of led us to believe that maybe small river populations are, are low. So, you know, one of the things I've had in the back of my mind when we noticed that the food deliveries were not as frequent as we liked was I just kept thinking when we went out to that nest site, there were bowl tunnels yeah. everywhere. And, you know, I had seen him with a bowl in his mouth, and it was just this sense of food is not an issue that I kind of couldn't shake. But, you know, then we talked about it, and you said, well, all those bowl tunnels aren't necessarily a sign that the, the population is still strong. So, um, so if you just want to talk about, you know, what that can mean to see all these bowl traces, but then you can still have a food shortage. Yeah, you know, normally when the snow melts, you see the sign. And so, because during the winter time they're living on the ground in what they call the subnivian world, where the snow melts back and there's a space between the ground and the snow, and there's a lot going on there of activity. But you know, plants are growing and animals are moving around and all that. And so once it melts back, you just see the evidence they were there. But one of the things that I noticed anyway is I saw plenty of sign, but I didn't see bulls. And normally when you, when bulls and or lemmings for snow owls. When they're abundant, you, you see them, they're, they're running around everywhere. Um, without quantitatively assessing it, we always like to say, if you walk around during the course of the day and you work and you see five or six bulls, that's pretty good. You see seven or eight, ten lemmings, that's really good. Um, I don't believe I saw a bull the entire time mm -hmm. that I was running around in the checking on the great gray. So, who knows what happens in the winter time, you know? Um, uh, do predators have an effect on the bull populations? And did they crash? Um, 
you know, some people think that that's what's going to happen is you can have a, a spring decline or a spring upswing, and that's when you get the really high nesting years, such as in the snowy owl. So, reasons for a decline, and we can't tell you if there's a decline because we haven't been doing the small metal trapping, but just on general observations in the springtime, based on years and years of doing this, I didn't see a lot of wool activity both in the forest and out in the plains and the grasslands where we have other uh, research projects. And to kind of buttress that argument too is our long red owls that we follow, and I'm sure we made three eggs that one nest had the camera on. And over the years, it, they're pretty consistent at five eggs. You know, they might lay three to seven, but it's, you know, the mean and the mode five, I mean, it's almost all the time they lay five eggs. And, and then it was initiated late. And then the other long red owls that we had there was no nest going on until this one here, and, they're, and everything was late, they were pairing up late and all that. Again, an indication that one, perhaps winter was long, and two, the bull populations uh, just weren't as abundant as we'd like to have. And so that carried over to shorties. Now, we didn't see a lot of shorter dolls during the spring in the courtship period, but we did see some. However, in the last 10 days or so, they've just up and disappeared. So another indication of maybe the small animal populations have declined for reasons that I'm not, I'm not sure we know. Maybe it's predation during the winter by aerial predators such as hawks and owls, as well as mammalian predators such as weasels, skunks in the spring, etc. Um, it could be impacts of just different types of snow, maybe, you know, sometimes you get a freeze, you'll get a thaw and a freeze, and that just affects mobility affects the ability to gather food, affects both the prey and the predators, you know, the hawks, owls, and the small mammals as well. But our gut feeling this year for wolf specials, such as long-eared owl, short-eared owl, gray gray owl, uh, and even solid owl to a point, not, not voles, but small mammals such as deer mice and white-footed mice, um, our gut feeling is those populations are down. Now, if you look at something like the great horned owl, who does eat a heck of a lot of voles, and when voles are abundant, uh, their diet consists primarily of voles, at least in this region here, but when voles decline, they're able to prey switch, and they're able to diversify, just given this how big and rotten and mean they are, you know? <laughs> and so they can go to voles, and then when they're going to eat them, but when vole populations crash, they can switch over, they can eat pheasants, ducks, uh, muskrats, uh, larger mammals, rabbits, and I think uh, on the video, there's been two white birds that have shown up in the nest that the great horned owls have brought in. And we think that they just uh, go across to the reservoir here and killing gulls and bringing them back, which they normally do. That nest always has a couple gulls every year. So the great horns can diversify, whereas the great grays, the uh, uh, solids, short ears, and long ears really can't. They have to up and leave the area or forfeit breeding or breed in small numbers or raise fewer young. The other thing, too, is we take the pygmy owl, who's another generalist feeder, and our pygmy owls right now, we've got a few nests going. We've just, just been doing the egg checks because we're just finishing laying now. And the two nests that we checked yesterday, they have six and seven eggs, which is quite a bit for an owl to be that big, you know, 60 grams or so, two ounces plus. And so the reason for that is the pygmy owls, like the great horns, are a generalist feeder. So when wolves are abundant or small mammals are abundant, they just catch them and eat them, and that's great. But when they're not, they also can eat of a lot of small birds. Perhaps 40% or more of the pygmy owl's diet is birds. So it can spread out, and then it wouldn't affect as much, you know, their cluster sizes or their breeding ability as it would the small mammal specialists. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, I, you know, from there, our great great study is um, right now it's sort of formatted as a 10-year study. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling it'll go on probably much longer than yeah, that, yeah. Um, if you look at the rest of our studies, but we're only in year two of that. But I just wanted to maybe touch on the snowy owl study, because that was a study that was specifically um, set up to be a predator-prey yes. relationship, and, and then its implications to breeding. So um, certainly we know a lot about what happens when food shortage is an issue, and if you just wanted to talk about that quickly. All right, uh, I'll go the great grape first. Yeah, we've collected data on great grapes for many years in okay. Montana, but then we finally sat down. We've collected kind of, you know, you might say haphazard, incidentally, and all that, uh, what we were doing other work. And then this year we've initiated a strong study uh, for a minimum of 10 years as we do with all our studies. So it takes that long. 
Uh, with the snows, yeah, we set that up initially, you know, just based on all of our knowledge of, of uh, snowy owls and lemmings. You know, it's kind of generally known that snowy owls are tied into lemmings. And so we set that up as a long-term study and looked at the dynamics of the lemmings and the owls, and which is now, this will be our 27th year going into that study. Hopefully we'll get a camera on that one, but we'll see. Uh, Matt comes up in about a week, and I'll go up in the middle of June. Uh, yeah, so we, we clearly see, it's a boom or bust um, ecological relationship, if you want to say that. And when lemmings are abundant, uh, the owls are abundant. And when lemmings go down in numbers, the owls go down in numbers. It also affects, so it affects the number of owls who breed, it affects the number of eggs they lay, and the number of chicks that they raise. And it's very, very clear when we look at our data that when the owls are high, the lemmings are high. When the owls are low, the lemmings are low. And in some years, they don't even breed. In other years, they may start breeding and they fail, like we're seeing with the great gray, although there's certain other circumstances going on there. But the uh, first great gray nest is totally, they didn't do anything there. And mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to go and breed up in that area. And we don't know yet if that pair who nested in the first great gray nest has nested this year somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, we don't know. We haven't able, able to find it yet. Exactly, we're trying to get the more information on that. But in a lot, in a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, predator prey relationships, that's exactly what happens. Most of the time, it's low to moderate breeding. And then every once in a while, you get the bumper crops. You have a lot of lemmings, you have a lot of bulls. Boom, the shorter it all is, the snowy it all is, the longer it all is. Key in on that, and they have a bumper crop as well. It's almost like farming. You know, you listen to farmers uh, throughout the United States, and you know, most of the time, life's tough. And then every once in a while, they get a bumper crop, and all the conditions are right. And that's the same thing with the small mammals, the lemmings, bulls, and the owls. So would you say it's a cycle? When I say it's a cycle, I, you know, when I uh, started out in uh, a lot of these shirts, I believe in cycles, but I don't believe in cycles anymore. I, I, I think clearly there's population fluctuations through space and time, but if you really look at the definition of the word cycle, which you really have to go back to, what is the definition of the word? And it means regularity through space and time with the same amplitude. Everything is the same, you know, for the most part. You know, moon rotates around the Earth for 29 and a half days. Earth rotates around the sun 365 days. That's pretty much cyclic. You know, there's very little variation in any of that. Uh, when you look at the lemmings and the voles, and each year the density can be different. You know, each year the amplitude can be different. Uh, the years that those highs occur aren't every four years or every six years or every eight years or ten years. It can be two year intervals, four year intervals, six, eight, ten, twelve, if you're moving into hairs. So, it really doesn't fit the definition of the word, but clearly the populations fluctuate. So I'm not a believer in cycles anymore, um, but some people still are. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's all up to, you know, I don't know, debate and data. Okay. Um, okay, so we have, she's still on the one egg, as, you, as everybody knows. Some people think they can see a crack or a puncture in it which, you know, we've talked about, and, and it's been talked about in the chat, that could have very well happened the night the great horned owl was kind of chomping around in the nest. But, um, but you thought if that puncture had happened from the great horned owl, that that egg would have likely hatched anyway. Is that right? Yeah, you know, it seems like if you think that, I, I believe the chick was taken uh, on its third day. Mm -hmm. Right around there, its third day. Okay. If okay. everything goes according to plan, that... The great gray owl, like many species of large owls, will lay an egg every other day. And an incubation period, I'm going to say 30 or so days, some people say up to 36, but let's just hang in there right around 30 for now. Um, then that chick should have been ready to hatch. Mm -hmm. And so if it was punctured just barely or so, um, it probably still would have hatched unless there was a, like a talon that went down in there and, mm -hmm. and perhaps killed the chick. If that all goes according to plan, maybe it's just a, an out of egg and um, it wasn't going to hatch in the beginning. I've been wanting to go in there and get it, um, but at the same time, I'm also interested in documenting what happens. You know, I think right now she's probably into her, close to her 40th or more days on that second egg. And if incubation periods are, let's say, 30 days, which I think is probably closer than 36. Great horns in that 33 range or so. Then uh, she has a prolonged incubation going on. And it's, uh, it's sad, but it's cool. Uh, it's a neat 
I need to hear me to watch this, this female, this mother trying to hatch her egg. You know, uh, I try not to get, you know, beyond, you know, factual about it, but it's, it's kind of neat to, to see motherhood here and uh, try to pull this off and it doesn't look like it's gonna happen. And then there's a part of me that wants to pull the egg and see if she'll relay. Uh, there's a few instances where the great grays have relayed um, after something happened to eggs or chicks. And usually that happens earlier on uh, in incubation. Uh, sometimes in nestlings, but um, would she do it? I don't know. Should I do it? I don't know. And um, at some point, what would, would we do? Would yeah. We, yeah. I mean, I'd like to know what's going on with that egg. And I want to get it before she completely abandons and uh, a magpie gets it. Mm -hmm. So we know. Yeah. Because Denver has said that he has seen eggs with a puncture from a talon, maybe even the mom. Yeah. And that they've gone on to hatch if they were close to hatching already. Yeah, I've seen it in snowy owls, but only, only one time I've seen it okay. where the female, should appear there was a, she punctured the egg with her talon. And we just left it there and eventually have some chick was raised. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just one thing back to the bulls. I should have asked this question before, but you said you actually haven't seen a bull when you've been there tromping around, except the night that you were tracking. Oh, and that's something oh, yeah, that I wanted to say too. So the other night Denver went to the site, located the male, and tracked him for about an hour. About an hour, yeah. And and that was just a cool thing that happened because he was out in the field, it was pouring rain, kind of a, a nasty night, but tracking this male, saw him during the course of that hour catch and eat two different bulls, yeah. had some questions about, you know, whether you were sure it was the nest male or another male. So he called me and said, hey, you know, I've got this male, has he been to the nest? Well, I've been camp going in my house all the time, but I was making dinner, so I hadn't been checking it all the time. But I went there, couldn't see, so I could say in the chat to all of you, have there been any deliveries? And you know, you guys were watching and reported immediately that there hadn't. So I said to Denver, no deliveries. And, and at that point, we pretty much felt like, okay, he does have the nest, nesting male yeah. then. And, um, and then you know, I came back to the cam, you ended up leaving, we had the time and location that you had left him. And then I could go back to the camp, watch him make another delivery, and we knew, you know, that in that time he had caught another bull, traveled this certain distance back to the nest. But you know what I was going to say is just this really cool thing because we were all working together. Denver was on the ground, I was on the camp, you guys were in the chat, and all that information came together in a, a really cool way. I thought. Oh no, I, it was really good. Yeah. It, it, you know, it solidified that what we were doing and we knew exactly what was going on only because all three of us were working together. Yeah. And I was watching the time. I knew the distance right. I had. I went to the mess. I checked the time here, the time there. Texted or called Liberty when it was. Checked the time here. Yeah. Let her know when we left. Got back here. She told me when the last delivery was. And we did see him catch two balls. <laughs> and, and I thought, great, he's going to go bring it back right. the first one. And I watched, and, he had, and it was a nice wall. I, I mean, it was it was a fifty grammar, you know. And so, uh, and so, I was pretty excited about watching it go back to the nest. But he flew, and he stopped, and he ate it. And oh, oh. and so, not that you know, he is a bum. He's got to feed too. And then he caught another one, and he ate that. And then he went to the other place and followed around for a while. And that's when it was just raining so hard that. Um, we had to leave. And so we left and then we did the whole timing thing. So mm -hmm. thanks to you and Liberty and yeah. technology, yeah, was super uh, cool. we were able to uh, say, yep, yeah, there he is. And he finally mm -hmm. got two for himself and brought one to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is just more information to put into this, you know, this puzzle of, you know, why, to me it all comes back to why was she up the nest for an hour that night when the chick got taken. Oh. You know? like, yeah. and, and, you know, like I said, maybe it's, Maybe food is short. Maybe he's not the most reliable male. Maybe it's yeah, or maybe okay. you know, maybe maybe she is. Maybe she's a young female. And it's the yeah. first time. It could be could be a whole host of things. We're able to look at the at the wings, and I did see two generations of feathers, and you can tell you have older feathers which are kind of light colored, and newer feathers which maintain the the the, the luster and the, and the melanin, and 
in doing so, we could tell at least they weren't in their first year of life. They were greater than one year, both of them. Mm -hmm. But I don't know exactly. We can't tell the full uh, molt scheme, but we can tell this. We can see a little bit of a difference between the feathers indicated that they're probably at least in their second year of life. So who, who knows if they've bred before? Mm -hmm. Is this their first time? Is this their third time? I, I, right. We don't know that. Yeah. So just in terms then of that pair, are you going to try to band them? Yeah, we got to we got we got to get them all marked, you know, because an important part of doing any of this stuff is knowing individuals. And you know, it would be nice to say everything is you know beautiful, leave them alone, and all that. And I, I think there's a lot of merit to that. But when you sometimes are arguing for conservation and management and protection and things of that sort. Uh, it's really important to know the individuals and what's going on in their lives and if they're coming back to the same areas, the same ones, the same mates. And so we're going to try to get these birds marked, uh, ban them, attract them and ban them. But I just have been really sensitive about the female right mm -hmm. now. And I just have been trying to give her as much of a break as possible. Um, but, you know, then you forfeit maybe losing her. If she disappears, maybe we won't find her. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, Anyway, but we, we're going to make a play for that here soon and mm -hmm. see if we get the mark and get some of the other birds marked. And uh, if any of you are listening, you're from Montana, we put out a little call for help uh, as far as locating great brown nests. Um, and we just want to find nests so we can measure them and from a more of a management perspective and have the characteristics of nests, build some models in the habitat and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess just to, I've got a couple other questions just about behavior, but just to, to finish up on this specific nest scenario, it's right now just a, a wait and watch to see what she's going to do and how long she's going to stay there. Yeah, she was off for quite a bit today. I, thought I know. She, I, thought she she was, I know. I know. I know. I, well, I thought she would be back, but I wonder if, you know, and especially with the heat, like it's got to be yeah. kind of tough sitting there. That might prompt her to say, okay. I'm ready to move on. Yeah, yeah, the sun jumps overhead mm -hmm. like that. Because it, it is suddenly uh, gotten... And that wrecks yeah. eggs, too. So if you're off eggs, yeah. it may be an inconvenience for you, but if you're off the eggs, the heat is more of an issue in eggs than most cold, in most situations. No kidding. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and everything just kind of melts in the inside. Oh, really? It adheres to the shell inside. So uh -huh. most of the people who study that stuff talk about heat being a, a really big issue for uh -huh. eggs and chicks. I didn't know that. Okay. Because it can't thermoregulate. Until depends on the species. It was probably a week or more before they can thermoregulate on their own. And of course, within the egg, it's mm -hmm. all dependent on the female's incubation patch to maintain the constant mm -hmm. temperature. Okay, so incubation patch that does bring up another question. Um, she's lost some feathers, or we've seen her pulling out some feathers. Could she be starting a mold right now? Yeah. Is, um, it, is this when it would happen? Yeah, normally. Females molt towards the end of the nesting period. Um, it used to be kind of thought that, excuse me, the energetic demands of molting were so great that birds didn't molt while they were uh, breeding because they had to put all this energy into laying eggs, incubating and raising young, etc. It takes a lot of energy to molt. I think, you know, in, in watching owls anyway now over the years, uh, clearly the females begin to molt towards the end of the nesting period. And, um, and maybe it's not that big deal physiologically. Maybe it seems like it to us, but maybe to them it's a different story. And we, we don't know that. I mean, we can measure things, but it doesn't mean that's the way it is. Uh, what I like to think is that the molt starts um, with the losing of the feathers for the creating the incubation path. So the increases in estrogen and prolactin stimulate all this defeathering in order to create the brood patch. And so as they maintain the brood patch throughout incubation, in this case, let's say 30 or so days, um, once the chicks hatch, they still have that, but feathers begin to start growing back in while other feathers are starting to fall off. And so perhaps that would, what we're seeing now is maybe she's starting to lose some body feathers uh, because it's over, and eventually she'll start to molt her flight feathers and stuff. And she'll molt before the meal. The theory is that once she's finished, she starts to replenish her feathers, but the male doesn't molt because he still has all this hunting to do and needs all his feathers. But he'll molt later because he has to, again, have his feathers to have all the best agility and hunting skills that he can, where she can go relax a little bit more now. So that's the idea behind it. But you have to remember, too, this is all theory. So I've never seen her brood patch. 
you know, when she's up on the side of the nest, I never see it. But it, but it's just that there are fewer feathers there than there. Oh yeah, if, if, you, if you can see it, it's just this big skin patch of skin right here. The snowy owl video. Right, because that's what I mean. Really, really the snowy really owl, well. and that's kind of what I was expecting on her, and it's totally different. Yeah, and it's only because she has such long. Okay, gotcha. Big long feathers. But if we were to catch her and spread it out, okay. we would see would this bare. root patch in here. And you can see the others start to grow back in on the longer owls. By about the time the chicks are fledging, the whole thing will grow back in. And then she'll continue to molt more body feathers and then begin the feather, the uh, flight of the male. Okay, okay. So, you know, this isn't super relevant maybe anymore. It was right after the chick was taken from the nest. And I know the Owl Research Institute doesn't try to study things like bird emotion. But is there any evidence that, you know, when something like this happens, that, that an owl would have a sense of loss? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I've seen where chicks have died um, and the owls look at them. I can tell you one story which is documented on the snowy owl video where they had five chicks four were pretty good size the fifth chick was small and it was losing weight wasn't getting food we could tell it was dying and so i had instructed the um videographers i said you, you got to get out there and you got to document this this is kind of interesting i, I have a feeling this chick's going to die and so what if you watch this video it's actually pretty cool and I don't know what the owl's thinking, I can't tell you that. But she comes in, and all the four big chicks run up to her, and then there's a small chick, chick number five. And she goes right to the chick, and she gets herself around, the chick gets up and underneath. She's clearly paying attention to the chick. That, I can would say, is my interpretation. She clearly is paying attention to this chick, which we know is losing weight is an indication of probably going to die. And so she gets over there and she nuzzles that chick and that chick gets up in there and she sits there and kind of protects that chick. Well, I can't remember how long it was later. The chick just kind of falls from her breast feathers and is laying there dead. And she's looking at it. She's now you can see it. You can interpret it yourself. And she's nudging it and moving it. She's, you know, trying to I don't know, figure out what's going on. It's, you know, again, it's not open to interpretation. Uh, you might say she's, there's emotion there, but I don't know. And then she picks it up. She holds it in her mouth. And she's just there holding it in her mouth. And then she walks up to the hill. And the other chicks come up to her. And then I don't know if we kept that in the video, but then she feeds it to the other chicks who are starving as well. There was a low living here, and everybody was, was hungry. Mm -hmm. And... So my thing was, she was nurturing, she was trying, she recognized that something was wrong with this chick. Then she picks it up, and who knows what she's thinking, walks up a little bit on the top of the nest. And then maybe she realized my other chicks are starving too, so she feeds this other chick to her other nestlings. And it's kind of gruesome, but... So who knows? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what female Great Grey is thinking when she looks down at that egg or that... She looks around at her chick was taken by the great horned owl. I don't know it, you know, it's so easy to apply, you know, our emotions to it. Um, and sometimes the interpretation makes perfect sense, other times it doesn't. So, mm -hmm. so that's all I can tell you. But watch that video of the snowy owl. Where do they see it? I've never seen it. It's, I don't know, what it is. So many <laughs> films on Magic of the Snowy Owl or. Something like that. It's all our work. They actually didn't give us any credit, but it's all our work. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's on, it's either PBS or Discovery, or okay. I don't know what it is. Like okay. Magic of the Snowy Owl. Or, mm, I've seen it. I've never yeah. watched it. But, but watch this one. Okay. They, they cut out the part where she fed the chicks, I'm pretty sure, because oh, okay. it was just, you know, they didn't think the public was ready for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But it's just life. Okay. Well, so one last thing, just while you're interpreting, do you want to? give a go at the great horned owl and its intentions coming to the nest. I, you know, I looked at that video, I just don't know what to think. Um, why was the female gone so long? I mean, it's just not normal. Um, was she there and the great horn scared her off? It didn't seem like it. There's no mm -hmm. vocalizations in the very end. Mm -hmm. And the horned owl seemed to make a hasty retreat when the great great vocalization started. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, because... 
It was interesting, you know, I don't know what was going through the great horse head, but, you know, did a look at it, and yeah, it just it took it, you know, and, and, it's and, really and it looked like it, was, it, it wasn't moving when it was in the great horse mouth. I yeah. thought maybe it was. But, right, you know. right, yeah. So uh, I don't know what to say about that. And then yeah. there was a little, uh, what, a few more great home interactions, and then it ceased for the most part, right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I haven't even heard anybody um, make notation of their calls in the background. Yeah, and I, I looked around for the Great Horn Nest and haven't been able to find it. Right. right. So uh, I would like to find it. Yeah. Because um, I wanted to see what was going on and if that was brought back to the nest. And, and how close it was. Yeah, and all that yeah. stuff. And, you know, if you think about the first Great Corral one, where the Great Grays are there, then the Great Horns, and the Great Grays, and the Great Horns, and the Great Grays, and then nobody, you know. Mm -hmm. and so um, the Great Horns are tough. <laughs> So, yeah. who knows? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that wraps it up, okay. unless you want to touch on anything else. No, no. We'll, uh, you know, who knows? We'll give you another chat when we can. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to get a snowy owl cam up this year. Um, it's been a while. We did it several years ago, but it's boomer bust up there, too. And, we and they didn't of... nest last year, it doesn't sound like. No, they didn't nest mm -hmm. last year. Mm -hmm. The year before, we had a couple nests, but they failed. Okay. And so, uh, so anyway, thank you, thank you for uh, all your comments and all your help and gathering information for us and uh, and your just general interest in, in what we do. And um, contact Liberty with your donations. We appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Okay.